Welcome to Surgeon Syndicate. If you're paying attention, you know that you only make money when you work. It might be great money, but it's dependent on you. The information on this podcast will help you solve that. We interview experts and provide analysis into financial freedom through commercial real estate. Why? To help physicians like you thrive. Let's dive in. Welcome to Surgeon Syndicate. I'm your host, Mike McManus, and we are here today with Darren Huang. I should have checked that before. How did I pronounce that right, Darren? (laughs) It's Huang, yes. Huang. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Over the past seven years, Darren has bought over 100 residential units in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He got tired of the midnight calls, especially one from the police, and is now focused into commercial real estate, specifically industrial. He now has over 150,000 square feet of industrial space. He's been married for seven years and has a three-year-old and a one-year-old. Darren, welcome to the show. Yes. And that's actually unupdated. They're four and two now. So uh, Four and two. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. That's fun. They're fun at that age. Yes, they are. So tell me a little bit more about your journey here, because we've heard this one before. A lot of people, they start out in in single family or multifamily and find out it can be a hassle. Yeah. So so in 2016, I got licensed as a real estate agent. I was just doing B2B sales. I hated how my commission and my, uh, you know, it reset every single month. And so I said, hey, listen, let me try to work for myself, being very entrepreneurial. Uh, got my license thinking that the brokerage path would be the route that I would take. So thinking that I would have a team underneath me, a buyer's agent, seller's agent, then maybe own a couple, uh, like a brokerage. So have multiple people working underneath me. I thought that was a path that I wanted to take, but it wasn't until 2017, I actually picked up my first investor client. And that really changed my world because it wasn't about the granite color. It wasn't about the wall color. It was about numbers. And so uh, one for me, it was unlimited commission based on the deal. Um, so I was just married at that point, no kids. So I had a lot of time. Um, and then also I, I got to see a, a, a deal go full cycle. Um, and I, I wasn't even aware that the birth strategy was a thing. I just thought you would flip homes or just own them cash as rentals. And he kind of showed me that entire different world. Well, that's awesome. So now You've you got tired of all the hassles of single single family. Now you're looks like you're mostly in warehouse and in the industrial sector. So what are the things that make this a great place to be? Yeah, yeah. So just kind of continuing that story, it was it really is one, two, skip a few, ninety nine, hundred, and just knowing, uh, just just having all the time in the world, and then having uh, like all like just trying to take it all on yourself. I thought that I was a really great operator. I thought I was a really great property manager, leasing agent, et cetera. But at, at a certain point, you kind of burn out. Uh, the thing that really drew me into commercial real estate and specifically industrial is triple net leases. And so net, net, net stands for uh, you net the taxes, you net the insurance, and you net all the maintenance and, uh, and, and uh, capital expenditures. And so you're able to charge the tenant all those things, wherein usually for residential you know, you have to pay your own property taxes, you have to pay your own property insurance, and then you have to, if the toilet is clogged or you have to repair something, that's on you versus it's completely different on the industrial and, and you know, sometimes retail. So triple net leases were really, really great for me. What's the difference in your interactions, how many interactions you have and how those interactions are with your tenants now? <clears throat> yeah. So once again, you are really providing a service to your residential uh, you know, clients, I would say, you know, they are your customers and, uh, for your service of actually being a good landlord, a property manager, or, you know, property owner, um, they are due that just because they pay in my opinion. Um, now com- uh, on the other side, commercial, they, it is very functional. It is business to business and they want to make money, um, and not just have a place to live or somewhere aesthetically pleasing. So the, I would I would say that I maybe get five to seven calls versus I get a call every single day, maybe two per day for the residential. So it is dramatically cut down. You're talking five to seven calls a month, or is that a year? Maybe. <laughs> maybe. Uh, on on some of them, they are a little bit faster moving. So my smaller bay is like I fifteen hundred square feet. Um, you know that that is is a little bit more hands on, um, just because that's on a year to year. Um, so sometimes you know I have to. Uh, update their 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 things too, um, but but on uh, you know I have an absolute triple net lease where I have not heard from them the whole entire year, 
And I just sent them a piece of mail saying they need to pay their taxes or insurance. And that's about it. That's all I do. That's awesome. So when you're talking about warehouse, and and I think this is where so most of the people we're talking to on this show are healthcare workers. And the idea of warehouse is is like this maybe overwhelming thing. Like we've 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 yeah. seen retail, we've seen apartments, but then a warehouse is like, what the heck goes on in there? And so there's lots of different warehouses. There could be like these brand new Amazon warehouses. And, and we see mm-hmm. some of those. So I'm in Green Bay, south of Milwaukee, as you head towards Chicago, down mm-hmm. to some are older buildings that look pretty rough. What's the difference between those when you're, when you're looking at them as an investor? So another point that I really like about industrial real estate is actually the largest asset class in uh, North America or uh, United States per square foot. Now it's not the most expensive, it's not the most flashy, but it takes up the most amount of space. And with that, there's uh, a lot of enigma that kind of comes into it. You know, you see Amazon, you also see like a contractor bay, like I said, a 1500 square foot bay, you know, those are really, really different, but that's all shuffled within industrial real estate. So uh, I kind of break down industrial real estate into three different categories. I'll just go over them and kind of give an example so that you have a kind of a clearer picture. So the categories are distribution and warehousing. So that's kind of the Amazon. There's manufacturing. Um, so think of anything that has to get manufactured. And then third is flex space. So that really is a catch-all anywhere from medical research, like a research lab, or maybe a technology point uh, where where they have uh, security systems and data centers and stuff like that, all the way to you know what normally we think of as like almost a Sherwin-Williams type. So once again, distribution at the very top level, you have FedEx, you have Target, you have Macy's, you have USPS, all those things, which is just a really large 30, 20 to 30 foot building um, that's just open, that just all it does is transform pallets to your door. Um, so that that's distribution at a very small level. You know, I have a, I have a small tenant that delivers hummus to their local, local grocery stores. So it gets manufactured in Texas, shipped up here to... Uh, to Tulsa and then from Tulsa to the grocery stores. Um, So once again, that's distribution. The second one, manufacturing, that's exactly what you think. It has to manufacture something. So here in Tulsa, and I'm guessing in in Green Bay and and Wisconsin, you know, you have manufacturers. So we have one, uh, Milo's Tea. So they manufacture tea and lemonade um, for the consumers. We also have Kimberly Clark that makes brands like Charmin, uh, yeah, Charmin and Bounty, so paper products. and then you know anything in between that. At a lower level, I have a small uh, business that's e-commerce based. They make bath bombs and candles, so they manufacture that. And then obviously they have a distribution point in the back of it that they go direct to consumer. And the third one is flex. I, I mentioned Sherwin Williams. You know sometimes they have a retail storefront, a couple like manufacturing points where they're mixing the paint and they're they're spinning it, uh, and then warehouse in the back where they actually take the five gallon or fifty gallon drums of of, of paint and going from there. So. That's kind of a comprehensive look of all this industrial. And then once again, there's different levels all the way from the big boy comp- cor- uh, corporations, billions, trillions of dollars, all the way down to the small business that I kind of mentioned. Well, that's it. And you mentioned Kimberly Clark because being in Green Bay, although in Green Bay, you hear a lot about the Packers and cheese heads and cheese. <laughs> but um, one of my favorite things I learned when I moved to Green Bay is Green Bay was where the first splinterless toilet paper was developed. Which, if you think about that, that's a major step forward in civilization. That is a huge uh, step forward. <laughs> so, so a huge part of, of actually Green Bay is the paper industry still, and a lot mm-hmm. of toilet paper, paper towels, uh, cardboard boxes. So, so when you the big those some of those those big factories, that's where you're talking about that falls into that manufacturing, but all the way down to where you're even saying in flex space could be making candles out of a. Uh, how big of, how big of a space does a candle plant require? Yeah, so this one is a pretty niche, um, and I think they're in a little less than three thousand square feet. Um, okay. But once again, they're e-commerce based, so they have a small warehouse in the front that does all their mixing and manufacturing, and then they have all their inventory in a different one in the back, and their offices are in between. So um, yeah, really great setup for them. That's a that's a great description how it can go from these really large giant manufacturing or Amazon type warehouses all the way down to what's really kind of a, a mom and pop factory uh, in a much smaller space. So when you get into the 
the smaller space, I guess, wait, wait, I, I wanted to go back there in the class. So, so we talked a little bit about, you know, like a brand new Amazon, that's a, a class A warehouse. We're still using class A there, right? Compared to multifamily. Mm-hmm. Yes. And then class B, what would be a class B or a class C warehouse? Yeah, it's usually depicted by age. And so they built things very similarly um, because there wasn't Amazon that needed to put a door, uh, put a package on your doorstep in two days. So class B really signifies anything from, let's say, 70s, 80s, 90s, even early 2000s. Um, Usually they're characterized, they have a little bit shorter uh, ceiling height. They're not as big. They don't have the technology or the truck courts, different things along those lines. But what the benefit is, is that they're closer to in town, closer to population. And so class B is more of a uh, description of age than, than it is like an actual condition, I would say. Okay. And is there C class or is it just A or B? Uh, yeah, C class is probably things that are, are on the verge of what's called functional obsolete. So once again, the need for pallet and robotics and forklifts and, you know, semi trucks and all this other stuff has been, you know, exploding in the past 20 years when Amazon was a thing and Amazon Prime was a thing. Let's just use that as the example. So class C, class D really is positioned, uh, needs to be either creatively turned around or made maybe into smaller flex space types that you can kind of bunch out in different things. But once again, that's reflective of an age and usually ceiling height and, you know, uh, condition to at that point, I would say. Okay. So when you're looking at some of these, and this is an area that's not my expertise, but uh, Mm -hmm. I'm learning about. So, so when you're talking about uh, your most valuable warehouses, door heights important. So you can bring in a full size truck, Mm -hmm. ceiling height, What's a, what's a, would you consider a, a, a reasonable ceiling height to be, to be a B or, or a class functional ceiling height? Yeah. And I'll, I'll just kind of go through all the, the categories because CBRE just did a, uh, a survey to their tenants. I believe it was actually last year in 2022. They asked them what was really important when looking at space. And so first is the ceiling height. So how many pallets can I stack? How, how can I get raw materials in this place in, in an efficient manner? Uh, if it's on the manufacturing, so ceiling height, how many doors does it have is the what's second a, sorry, category. Just how, what's a, what, what's the ceiling height that would be considered? Oh yeah. Yeah. High, you know, that nobody's going to be worried about it being too low. Yeah. So right now, Amazon is getting developed anywhere from 32 to 40 foot clear. So okay. anything below that closer to 20 to 30, that would be considered class B somewhere on there. Uh, it's very functional, very usable 24 to 28. Um, it is very, very functional. Uh, my first warehouse I bought at 20 foot ceiling, ceiling height. And then I do have some stuff that's fully climate controlled all the way at the 12 to 14. But as you can see, it really restricts. That's not a distribution play at all. They can't fit as many things as in there as probably necessary. Okay. So then we're getting to, to doors. Yes. So the second most important thing was how many doors and the layout of, you know, how things transport and, and are, uh, you know, egress, ingress, stuff like that. So there's two types of doors. There's a grade door and that's what's called a dock high door. So those are the two types. Grade door is like your garage door. You can drive into it. Sometimes there's a ramp up to it, uh, but sometimes, you know, it's just flush to the ground. And then the dock high is exactly that. It's used for semis. Sometimes there's a leveler. Sometimes there's different things like that. But um, those doors, depending how small, small and big and how many, how they're laid out is really important for that user. Is that is one better than the other, or does it just depend on what they need? Yeah, it just depends on what they need. Usually for distribution, I think the ratio is probably like 10 or 15 to one. So they really don't need that many grade doors because the the access point is all docks and semis. Now, if you have an auto body shop, they don't really care for semi, you know, access. They want to drive their cars in and out of the lift. So it just depends. Um, you know, a good rule of thumb is that uh if if you have uh a 10 by 10 is kind of just the most basic, the very most functional. They're smaller sizes, not really usable. 14 uh, to 16 is really that clear, uh, is that uh, the magic number so that you can actually drive a semi through if you're to work on a semi truck. So 14, 16, kind of remember that. So really the bigger, the better, and then the more, the better, but then they have to functionally be laid out correctly too. Are there doors over 16 or is that kind of as high as you really need? 
Yeah, I mean, they're they're. I mean, if you think of an airplane hangar, they have those big doors also. So really, the, the sky's the limit. You know, pun intended. Uh, so you know, those hangar doors are humongous. If you watched any movies like you know Top Gun, whatever, sure. uh, that that is an industrial building also, and that is a classification of door. Uh, so so yeah, yeah, I guess yeah. so. But <laughs> but for the you most have to be part, functional. Yeah, yeah, for the most part. Yeah, if you're talking <laughs> trucks. Uh, 16th is as high as you're going to need unless it's a special use like for planes yeah, or some special like giant truck mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay so beyond the the ceiling height and door height other considerations yeah yeah so another one is heavy power uh so a lot of uh you know the the potential next wave is going to be ev trucks or you know at least charging for people's electronic vehicles um, but heavy power is really necessary for machineries. That's probably more important, not on the distribution side, but also, you know, the manufacturing, they have heavy power, they have heavy machinery, they need a lot of that power. So if you don't have that power, guess what? You are completely eliminated. They're not even going to look and tour at your place. So having heavy power, I believe it was like 56% of people really need that. That okay. one's pretty self-explanatory. Um, yeah. I think the next one on the list, number four is room to expand in yard space. I think this has really taken a lot of people by storm and a lot of the investment world by storm. It's called industrial outside storage. But imagine trying to move a big operations like an Amazon warehouse from one place to another. That that takes a lot of time. So I think a lot of people are looking, hey, we want the room to expand or we want the yard space to keep things even though we're not you know, technically paying the price point per square foot. So okay. um, yeah, that's pretty self-explanatory, I think. So is that something from an investor standpoint, if, if you're looking at a, a warehouse that's got significant additional developable acreage that makes that better because you can offer outside storage and it offers room to add more warehouse if they need it and they don't have to move? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so I would say anywhere in a metro that has land is uh, considerably more uh, you know, valuable. Um, just because especially as metro areas grow and grow and grow, you can find some acreage on the suburbs. But when you're trying to tap into workforce, when you're trying to tap into, you know, visibility and then, um, you know, being very close to your consumer, um, whether it be for manufacturing or like a tradesman or the actual door to your doorstep kind of delivery, um, that all really is very big consideration. So, um, yes, land is really important. And and most cities don't want to just have that be a space they want it to be developed they want to they want people to shop there or pay more taxes on it and so they're not really zoning that much more land in town in you know in places um for that so it, it becomes very valuable for, for some cities yeah for some places. okay so if somebody were looking at buying warehouse space and you found warehouse in town you know that that's going to be of higher value because it's it's hard to replace versus you can go yes. build it on the edge of town, um, but it's going to be more valuable in town. Yeah, definitely. Um, considerations, you know, w when people are looking for tenants, uh, are looking at a space, they want to look at, you know, the, the, the surrounding areas. How easy access is it? Is it close to an airport? Is it close to a highway? Is it close to a port if you're close to a body of water? Uh, railroads too, you know, if they use that for their, um, you know, transportation. And then second is the workforce. You know, how far does a skilled workforce, especially in manufacturing, how far is the skilled workforce away from this area? If it's 40 minutes away, that's not a great site for them. If it's 15 minutes, they'll pay considerably more um, to, to have that 10 minute route than a 40 minute route, if that makes sense. Yeah, because that's part of their hiring process. If they can, if they can be in a location that people love living close to where they work versus having to drive 40 minutes to get there. Mm -hmm. And then also just from statistic points, I wasn't planning on getting into this, but the cost, the most costly thing for, you know, a distribution, uh, like say Amazon, we'll just use them as a blanket, but it's Target, it's Walmart, it's everybody um, to get on your doorstep. That is the most expensive part from the final destination to your doorstep. And so if they can it, it, say they're only paying, um, so a statistic came out, a statistic came out once again, real estate cost for distribution is only three to 6% of their total cost. The rest is, uh, you know, gasoline, uh, transportation and workforce and the higher there. So they will pay 
six to seven percent or even a one percent more than they're paying so that they can uh dramatically decrease the workforce cost and the the last door to your doorstep cost too so you know they, they don't mind paying one percent more to then you know save five percent on uh gasoline and fuel cost so that core being in town and uh you know uh be you know being close to the doorsteps are really important to them so that that whole distribution process this is another this one's a little bit new to me so from that uh so the, you know like we said we're in green bay so down between milwaukee and chicago down towards the the illinois border there's a giant new uh amazon warehouse you know one of these ones that you drive by and you're driving by it for a while and you're still driving by it for a while <laughs> so, yeah so so after the stuff leaves so what goes on in that warehouse is that where it's just coming from all over is that for distribution to like chicago land and milwaukee or or What's going on in the giant warehouse? This is just a complete guess. What I'm going to guess is since it's not close to that, what's called the last mile delivery, that's probably a distribution center. So a lot of that goods come there, then they go to a separate smaller uh, facility. And then from there, they get loaded up on the trucks to your doorstep. So most so it's likely it's a very strategic position in between Milwaukee, Chicago, Illinois, to be able to do that. But that is the second to last stop and maybe third to last stop. Okay. Third to last stop. Where, how many stops do they have before that one? I'm just in understanding warehouses, trying to understand distribution, maybe a little more. I don't know if this yeah. is outside of. Yeah, I would say I'm, I'm guessing at this point, uh, educated <laughs> okay. guess, especially for that uh, facility, but um, it's kind of crazy to think the actual journey of even a simple thing like a marker to your your doorstep. Um, you know, if you just kind of backtrack it, okay, this marker was in a cardboard box. It went to the distribution center, then it went to probably another center, but then it was, uh, you know, uh, imported from the 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 port of L.A. So then it was on a ship, and then it went back to China, and then it was in a manufacturing thing from China. So I mean, that's relatively very sh short and condensed. Uh, but then even the cap for this was maybe manufactured in somewhere else. And then the tip for that and the ink for that was all put assembled in a, in a place in China, or I don't know if this was made in China or, or the United States, but you know, if you can kind of think there's probably 16 different parts that came together in a factory, that factory then went to the port, that port then went to the ship, to the, the, the port of LA. And then that went on a, to another warehouse, then to another warehouse and maybe to that that last distribution center then to your doorstep so okay succinctly put that might that's kind of the distribution chain if you well, will and that helps so from that big warehouse you know mm -hmm. down there how many stops are there before it gets to my door in green bay yeah maybe two more stops maybe one so i don't know how far away it is from you but sometimes there's a three hours. if it goes to that yeah okay so then yeah probably two or three stops so it might go from or that three. large one it goes up two to three hours, then goes to the distribution center there. Then it goes to that last mile delivery. Um, and then it goes to your doorstep. So yeah, maybe okay. two or three. How big is this? So that was a, a, that's a really big warehouse, like we were saying. Yeah. So then the, the next one, so we have the one in between and a last mile, let's just say. Mm -hmm. So the, the one in between, how big is that warehouse? Um, I, you know, once again, not knowing Green Bay, how large it is. Uh, if that Green Bay's was 300,000 Metro. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, so I'll just kind of speak to Tulsa. If that was, let's say that was three hours away from Tulsa, Tulsa has one plant that's on the West side. It's a DC. Um, and so that one is, I believe 400,000 square feet. Okay. Um, and so I'm so, guessing the one that that is three hours away is millions square feet, maybe even more. Um, so million down to 300 to 400, maybe yours, since you're a little bit smaller is 200 to 300. Okay. then it might go to uh that might that might directly ship from there so i know that they do last mile from that but if it doesn't then it goes to the one in broken arrow where i'm at and that one's only like sixty thousand square feet but they okay. also use a lot of like usps and fedex people um as subcontractors so that might go somewhere else and then it goes to my door so so this, yeah, the, from, the last step for somebody big like amazon is still 30 40 000 square feet yeah I yeah maybe done. that one okay. is very small that one's that one's particular the 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 amazon in in broken arrow is only sixty thousand. um okay. i would say it's probably going to be a hundred plus that that's probably what makes sense to them hundred okay. plus thousand square feet yeah so when uh 
if we're looking at somebody who's not as big as Amazon, <laughs> do they have the same distribution type thing that's smaller or are they like using Amazon or somebody else for their, for that shipping yeah, for that la- you know, to get to that last mile where it gets delivered? Yeah. So they're usually either using Amazon as a third party fulfillment. They're sometimes using USPS or FedEx for that last mile. Um, and so it just depends on the e-commerce and different things like that. So this is, um, yeah, yeah, I would say they're most likely using third party, um, in that aspect. Uh, and a lot of that third party logistics, three PLs as they're called, uh, has been gobbling, have been gobbling up space. So it's not just like Amazon, but it's also they're contracted out for other things too. So three PLs. Okay. Awesome. Darren, this has been so awesome and we're going to wrap up this part of the show and darren's going to be back for another episode and i want to get into more some of this this now we see warehouse clusters and and learn more about that so thank you so much for being here and we'll be back for the next one please join us again on surgeon syndicate this has been an episode of surgeon syndicate if you got value from this episode you know other surgeons are hungry to become job optional and you can help them by sharing this content today. Schedule a call and we can make a plan. Looking forward to having you with me on the next episode.